G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And before the episode begins, I would like to give Best Fiends a shout out for sponsoring this video. So, as you guys know, true crime and horror is my passion, but even I need the occasional break here and there. So, when I feel like I need a bit of a mental palate cleanser, my go-to refresher is Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a great little game that features an array of puzzles with an engaging story, and is just a really fantastic piece of entertainment for casual gameplay. I've been playing it on my phone over lunch, and also when I get dragged out to do some shopping with my girl, and I've personally found it to be pretty addictive. I guess that's the really great thing about Best Fiends too. It's just a great little casual game that you can pick up, play as much or as little as you like, and put it down and come back to it at your own convenience. In other words, you don't have to invest huge amounts of time in it to really enjoy it. I also love the aesthetic of the game in that you can engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of little cute characters too. It's a 5 star rated mobile puzzle game on the Apple App Store and Google Play as well, and you can download free on the Apple App Store or Google Play today. Oh, and uh, remember too guys that that's friends without the R, best fiend. This happened about seven years ago, but it still really freaks me out. My hometown has a canyon that is rumored to be haunted. The story is that a, a woman lost her husband in a mining accident and she haunts the canyon searching for him. In this same canyon there exists a building, very much off the main trail, named the Devil's Playhouse because it's said to be the place where devil worshippers go on satanic holidays in order to do their rituals and whatnot. I was a, a wannabe ghost hunter and spent a lot of time in that canyon, specifically drawn to the playhouse. It was an old factory with a lot of mysterious writings in the walls and holes into rooms that had no entrance. To get to the factory, you had to drive way off the trail on a very beaten up dirt road and just after the house there was a fence. As daring as I was, I always turned around at the fence so I could get out of there easily if I got scared. From there, you had to climb in and out of the deep ditch to actually get to the playhouse. But here's what happened that caused me to never go there again. I had brought my younger sister and two younger cousins up there one day. We were messing around just taking pictures when my little sister swore that she saw a camera pointed towards us from the rocks outside of the window of the warehouse. I didn't really see it, but my sister was really freaked out. We decided to take a break from the playhouse after this and we walked about 100 feet to a bunch of large stone fixtures. Now, I had been up that canyon many, many times and rarely did I ever see another car, especially at the Devil's Playhouse, but suddenly a truck made its way along the trail. When the driver caught sight of us, he slowed down to probably 5 miles per hour and the passenger was very noticeably pointing a camera our way. They then proceeded to drive past my car, then back up to it so that we were bumper to bumper, and I really thought that they were going to tow my car or something. They left their truck on, and then the two men stepped out and climbed through the ditch. They walked around the far side of the playhouse from us, and my sister pointed out that it was the side the camera was on. I was the adult in this situation, so I was coming up with any reason to give these guys as to why we were there just in case we were trespassing or something like that. We had walked back to the house to get to the only safe part of the ditch, and as we approached, the man stepped out. They were probably mid-30s or so, and when they did, they didn't say a word. They just stood where we had walked, right past them with no emotion on their faces at all. We made it to my car and drove off, but I had a really sick feeling in my stomach like they were hiding something up there. And so I decided to park at the base of the entrance of the trail, to the playhouse that is, and just wait for them to come back down. I was stupid, I know, and it was a foolish idea, but I did it anyway. We sat there for a little bit, but after a while, another car pulled up beside us and the old man who was driving it just stared at us. He was uh, seriously creepy looking too and it scared the shit out of us so 
Uh, I drove back down to town, and the whole way, that car followed us. He even parked at the gas station that we went to, and we had gone inside, and he sat in the parking lot for a good 20 minutes before we just left. I'm still not entirely sure what happened up there that day or why, but I have a feeling that there's something hidden up there. My house growing up was a two-family with a pretty big basement. We lived on the top floor and the basement was used as storage and as a laundry room. The basement was uh, pretty terrifying. It was always pretty dark, all the lights were in the center of the room, so you had to go into a completely pitch black room, reach your hand up and pull on a string to turn the light on as well. I don't think I ever went into the basement without a, a weapon of some sort at least. When I was 10 though, my mum left me a note to move the clothes in the wash to the dryer, so I went into the basement, picked up a wiffle ball pat and proceeded into total darkness. I've literally been preparing to turn that light on and see some kind of monster for years. I pull the string and take a step and look up to see a man. He was breathing heavily and looked disheveled. I completely froze. I'm literally shaking to a point that the wiffle bat is sliding out of my hand. Before I can do or say anything, I hear a gun being cocked and my father from behind me say... If you take one step forward, son, I'll blow your fucking head off. The man standing before me takes a few steps back, turns, and runs out the door that leads to the backyard. And long story short, I went downstairs. At the exact same time, my dad watched from the kitchen window as two guys were being chased by the police through the backyard on my street. He saw one of the men hop the fence into my backyard and check the door to the basement. He realized after a few seconds that I was in the basement. And these days, I still struggle to go into the basement. I'd like to think that I have a pretty decent instinct now when it comes to knowing who has bad intentions, but I wasn't always as cautious and as observant as I am now. When I was in high school, I always just felt so ugly I had low self-esteem and anxiety, which was really more of a problem rather than my looks. And so, if any one of the opposite sex gave me even a little bit of attention, I would start to like them. I was pretty innocent despite how desperate I was, I suppose, having only kissed one boy. So, when I was 17 and a college guy put interest into me, I immediately clung to him. I was on this app before Tinder, and met a guy who lived about seven hours from my home city. His name was Brandon, and he was gorgeous. Blonde hair, muscular, blue eyes. He played soccer for his university and was 19 years old. Honestly, he wasn't my usual type. I really like guys with darker hair and eyes. I still do, but he was really handsome and also really kind. He would shower me with compliments and talk to me all the time. I lived alone, long story, in an apartment with just my cats, so when I would get lonely or scared, he always comforted me. Now, a month into talking, he started asking for pictures. Not ones of my face, but obviously nudes or bra pictures. Now, this was uh, nearly six years ago, and I didn't have a good concept of stranger danger on the internet. I mean, smartphones had only really been around for about two or three years at this point, at least in my school and with my age group anyway. 17-year-old me, who was so insecure as well, wanted to make him happy because I couldn't believe that I'd gotten a guy like him. I was ready to do anything that he asked, basically, and I never sent naked pictures. I was just too insecure for that, but I would send pictures of me and my bra. He would always shower me with compliments saying how sexy and beautiful I was, and I fell for every word. With time, I started to get upset though. I wanted to see him and I would always send him pictures whenever he asked, but he would never send me any. He would show me body pictures of him with his shirt off or things like that, but the pictures were always bad quality. When I started getting too persistent, he promised that he would start calling me. For some reason, this appeased me and we'd talk many times a week. After a couple of months, he got increasingly more sexual with me though, telling me what he wanted to do with me and how badly he wanted me. 
This made me nervous since I'd only ever kissed one boy, but it also made me a little excited. It felt good to be wanted by someone I had really grown to like. Oh, uh, this was all during the first semester as well of my senior year of high school, and I was about to turn 18 the next semester in late January. As it got to Christmas time, he started to talk about coming to my city to see me for my birthday. This had me really excited since I wanted to see him in person so badly. We had first talked about me going to him, something that he insisted on, but I chickened out and I said that I couldn't do the drive alone. It was an excuse though, I really didn't want to go to an older guy's house and stay with him alone. My own house made me feel more safe. Anyway, we planned on a weekend after my birthday and honestly, everything seemed fine. But then one day in my choir class, my best friend, an exchange student from Germany, was talking with me about him. I was telling her about him and showing pictures and she got very unsettled. Hey, have you seen him on a video or anything? I told her no and she gave me a skeptical look. Something doesn't feel right. There's no way that he's real. Not that you couldn't date someone like him, but he's just too perfect. She was very direct and blunt with me about it, something my other friends weren't. So I took her words deeply and, man, am I so thankful that I did. I immediately asked him for a picture of his face. He made up some excuse about how he couldn't take a picture right then, so I persisted, asking every single day. Finally, my instincts seemed to be kicking in and I was getting scared. I told him that I wanted him to video call me and he said no. I fought him on it for hours one night, telling him that if he tells me the truth, I won't get mad. But he refused. I put the name that he gave me into Facebook, determined to find him on my own if he wasn't going to give in. But nothing came up on him. I texted him, telling him that I couldn't find his Facebook. And he gave in, giving me a completely different name, and told me, that's me. I remember just feeling cold as I read that too, but I looked up the account and everything that he had told me was a lie. His name, his face, his age, he was 25, not 19, and I was terrified. I thought that I'd been talking to someone just two years older than me, which is legal in my state, but he was eight years older. And after this, I immediately stopped texting him. But that was when he started getting obsessive. He would text me dozens of times a day, call me over and over again. He would beg me to answer him, to give him a chance. Then he started threatening me to answer and he told me that he had saved all of my pictures. He kept them all and told me that he would send them to my friends and my family on Facebook. Show everyone me and my bra and show our text messages talking about what he would do to me sexually if we met. Looking back... All of that was more damaging to him than me, but I was young and stupid and I was afraid. I hated my body so much and I was terrified of people seeing it. So, I started talking to him again. More reserved and cautious this time, of course, but nevertheless, we started talking. The days inched closer to my birthday and the weekend that we had planned. Our messages had become bland and short since I was trying to make him lose interest in me, but... He just never gave up. If I took too long to message, then he would threaten me again. My birthday fell on a Monday that year, and he sent me all kinds of messages. I don't even really remember what I did that birthday. I didn't have many friends, and I've never liked to celebrate anyway, so it was probably pretty small. But when Friday hit, I got a text from him that morning saying that he was driving to my city, and that he would pick me up from my school. I was honestly terrified. I had lost all of my friends a semester before. Again, another long story. So, they obviously had no clue of my situation. Out of desperation too, I went to one of my guy friends who I hadn't talked to in a couple of months and spilled everything to him. He was a long time friend, so he was sympathetic and promised to follow me home that day. I went straight to my car, ignoring the mass amounts of text saying, Where are you and I'm here. My friend drove behind me all the way to my apartment, which he had no clue that I was living in, and stayed with me as I just cried for a while. I turned my phone off after this, and my friend left after in the night. Brandon had no clue where I lived, but I was definitely still paranoid. I mean, what if he somehow found me? Only three people knew where I lived, 
before now with my guy friend, and he didn't come in contact with any of them. When I did finally turn my phone on, he was threatening me again. I was just so exhausted and fed up at this stage that I started spam texting him, yelling and venting. I told him how stressed he had made me and how what he was doing was wrong. I told him that he could send the pictures and that I just didn't care anymore. I started to attack his character, telling him how no one could love him if he hides who he is and then treats people like shit when they catch him in a lie like this. And thankfully for me, he had enough care for me to take my words to heart. He apologized and told me that he deleted all the pictures. He swore to leave me alone as long as we can still talk every once in a while as friends. I agreed, even though I knew I was lying. I talked to him for about a month, short responses until he just finally gave up. But even now at 22, I still see his name appear sometimes. I blocked his number and deleted him on everything, but his name still shows up sometimes on my Instagram or Snapchat when he's trying to react. He's the reason I don't give my name or picture out, and he isn't the first stalker I experienced. The first one was actually in the sixth grade, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, let this be a lesson to anyone out there who's listening. Please be careful with who you share your information with, because just like me, it can come right back around to bite you in the ass. This is fairly long because it took place over about a year. I'm also a bit of a flowery writer, unfortunately, so please bear with me. So I'm a nanny and I'd been with my current family for about two years when the oldest started preschool a couple of days a week. I'd drop him off around 9 and pick him up at 12.30 bringing his baby brother along. Now, this school was very hoity-toity and most of the families who sent their children there were very wealthy. Everyone entering the building had to wear badges with their names printed out. Every entrance had a security guard and metal detector. They employed about 10 security guards around the building that patrolled the place from open till close. I became very familiar with several of them because I'd pass them at their posts on the way in and out. Most were cops just making a few extra hundred dollars on their days off and whatnot, so they were fairly nice. And well, during the fall of 2017, the older boy moved to a new class on the other side of the school. This entrance was never as populated, so it was just a couple of people going in and out of the door during the day. The security guard was from a private company. He was always extremely polite and friendly. Definitely one of the nicest security guards without a doubt. He was probably in his late 20s, I'd say. I thought that he looked like a young Santa Claus, if I'm being honest. Round, jolly face with a permanently red nose and cheeks framed by a thick brown beard, thin framed glasses and curly brown hair that went to about his shoulders. I eventually learned that his name was Nick as well, which only solidified my comparison. Months passed though, and we'd seen each other two or three days a week. The boys loved to wave to him, and he'd always ask how our day was, and we'd respond. In January of 2018, I actually came down with the flu and I missed about two weeks of work. When I returned, I continued our regular schedule of school drop-offs and pickups. I was walking past Nick too and I waved and he stopped me and said that he noticed that I was gone for two weeks and he hoped that I was feeling better. I smiled, thanked him and said that it was the sickest I'd been but I was glad to be back. I found it a bit odd though that he had noticed and that he knew that I was sick. I assumed that my employers had told him when they did drop-offs or pickups while I was gone or something, so I didn't think too much of it and I just continued on, but when I went to leave, he stopped me again and told me that he didn't know that I wasn't the boy's mother. I laughed at that and basically said people confuse me for their mum because I'm with them all the time and we kind of look a little bit similar. He laughed too and then said, I was wondering, I never saw you with your husband and you don't have a ring on your finger so I thought that you were just a single mum. I laughed nervously to this and didn't know what to say back so I said, nope, just the nanny. I wanted to kick myself when I got back in the car. I was caught off guard and I'm generally a bit awkward so tend to not respond the best when put on the spot like that. I guess I just didn't realize that he'd paid that much attention to me. I'll admit that I was a little bit uneasy, but I found it harmless for the most part. 
the next drop-off day, I said hello, and he responded by calling me by my name, which he had never done before, and telling me that I looked nice, which he had definitely never done before, and I was pretty surprised. I started to think that he may be interested in me since learning that I'm not actually a single mum. This was weird for me because I'm actually gay and I look very gay, so men very seldom take an interest in me, so when they do, I'm actually pretty weirded out. But when I left, we exchanged a simple goodbye and the rest of the week was pretty non-eventful if I'm being honest. In early February, I was doing the drop-off yet again when, on the way out with a baby strapped to my chest, Nick stopped me. He was very courteous, but he asked me if I'd be interested in going to dinner with him some weekend. And again, I'm incredibly awkward, so my response was to laugh, and I could see that he was immediately offended. I apologized immediately and tried to explain to him that I was actually engaged and had been in a long-term relationship. But this was true as well. And his face changed and he said, well, where's your ring? The way that he said this too just made me feel uncomfortable. I felt accused and defensive. I told him that I don't really like wearing jewelry to work, so I only wear it on the weekends. I had accidentally scratched the baby with the ring when he was just a newborn and basically I just decided that it wasn't something that I'd wear when caring for them. He didn't seem satisfied with my answer, but let me go and told me to have a good evening. When I came to pick the older boy up that afternoon, Nick just seemed agitated. I said hello and there was no answer. Okay. I was upset at that, but I let it go. I didn't want to hurt this guy's feelings, but really? Could he not tell that I was gay? The constant button-ups didn't clue him in. Did I need an undercut or something? It wasn't personal, but why was he so angry? When I left, he again ignored me. I just kind of swallowed my pride and thought, oh well, he'll get over it eventually. I'd put the baby in the seat in the back of my car too and was buckling up the three-year-old when a voice behind me boomed, you don't have to lie to me. I whipped around and Nick was about a foot away from me. I was grabbed between the car, the open door and his body. He no longer looked like his jolly polite young man self and he was big, probably about 6'2 and easily 400 pounds. Quite honestly, I was scared and I was also angry. I mean, how dare he come up to me and scare me like this? How dare he corner me and intimidate me when he knows that I'm just doing my job? I hurried out of the situation though and I shut the door and locked it with the keys in my hand. I tried to back up but he said, you didn't need to lie to me. If you aren't interested in me, just tell me. I don't like liars. I didn't know this guy anything, but I explained that I wasn't lying. I said that I'm engaged and it's nothing personal. I said that he was a nice and friendly guy and that I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. He was angry though and he huffed and said, Oh, you didn't hurt my feelings. I just don't appreciate the dishonesty. You lied about being their mother, so I figured that you were lying about this too. I was mad. I never once lied about being their mother. He assumed this because I was the one doing the drop-offs and the pickups. Our conversations just never got beyond hello, good day, and goodbye until recently. I decided, though, that this conversation was over. He was talking down to me and accusing me of just nonsense. I told him that I never lied about this or anything and didn't appreciate his tone. I went around and got back into the car and he followed but kept his distance and said, oh, I'm not even sure why I wasted my time on you anyways. I was shocked. I mean, he was just a completely different person now. I avoid altercations at all costs, so for someone to speak to me like this was pretty upsetting, I'll admit. I ended up disclosing this situation to my employers who got very upset as well. They did not like that he spoke to me like that and especially didn't like this done around their children. They ended up contacting the school which I was mortified about. I was terrified to see him again knowing that he'd know that I had told him. That never happened though because he was fired and replaced with a retired cop who was incredibly unfriendly and boy, was I grateful for that. But I did feel bad. 
Uh, I thought that my employers had overreacted, but they were prone to overreactions, and honestly, I was selfishly a little bit happy that I wouldn't have to see him again. I was, uh, I was worried about how awkward it was actually going to be. I let it go though, and weeks passed and school drop-offs were pretty much uneventful again. However, in May of 2018, that all changed. So I live in an enclosed, so I live in an enclosed apartment complex in uptown Dallas. Our apartment and a neighbor's has a ton of bars, so we have issues with break-ins and vandalism from here to there. We've also always had a police presence, but after an incident where some drunk guy broke into the office through a window, the office manager decided to hire security guards. And I bet you can guess who ended up doing the night shifts, right? Yep, it was Nick. When I first saw him, I was checking my mail and he passed me in his uniform. I completely froze and he looked me directly in the eye and said, Good evening, man. Good. He must have forgotten me, right? I was shaking as I went up to my apartment and immediately told my fiancé who I saw. She was aware of the situation with Nick at the preschool and being the daughter of a cop was always more suspicious and suspected the absolute worst out of pretty much everyone. She did not want him to find out which apartment was ours so we started taking the back elevator and parking in different areas. He only patrolled the office area, the perimeter of the building, so we actually found it pretty easy to avoid him for at least a week or so. He only patrolled the office area though and the perimeter of the building, so we found it fairly easy to avoid him for at least a week or so. Now one day, the back elevator was out of order, so I had to take the front elevator from the parking garage up to my apartment on the fourth floor. The elevator stopped in the lobby and guess who walks on? It was Nick and... I completely froze. I guess that he could sense that I was anxious too because he looked at me and said, Don't worry, I'm not mad. You got me fired, but just don't do it again. I didn't even respond and I got off on the fourth floor and then thought, Oh crap, now he knows which floor I lived on. I immediately ran inside and told my fiancé and she said that she would contact the management. I convinced her that this was a very bad idea it could make him angry, and I doubt that he would let it go again. I mean, he technically hasn't done anything, but did he follow me here? He knew me, but how did he end up here? It seemed like too much of a coincidence, I'll admit. I will say, though, that we did live in a bit of a panic. We kept our door bolted, and we even installed a camera. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the story of Jennifer Morey. She was a young lawyer who was living alone in an apartment similar to mine in Houston. She was stalked and attacked by her apartment's security guard and he actually had access to her apartment. She survived but went through a horrible ordeal and we were both terrified that this could happen to us. It got to the point where pretty much every noise unsettled us. We'd get up to make sure the door was bolted several times before we would go to bed. And that summer, we were convinced that he'd try to do something. And maybe it was just our overreactive, worried minds, but better safe than sorry. But we ended up avoiding him for the most part, and we saw him occasionally, but he didn't seem interested, and although we were always wary, we figured that he must have gotten over it, and we let our guards down. And he never did bother me again. He never said much of anything to me when I did see him, and... I decided that maybe he was just having a really hard time last fall and he was a really nice guy who maybe didn't have the best social skills or something. Now, fall 2018 rolls around and I'm busy with work and my fiancé is out of town, often on business meetings. When one weekend, I'm home alone and it's 3.30pm and I'm walking down to the office to get a package. And when I get there, there are about three squad cars and police just all over the lobby and going up the stairs. I'm wondering what happened, but like I said, we live in a pretty ratty place, so we have incidences with drunk assholes, so I figured someone had an altercation or something got stolen or something like that. I try to eavesdrop, but I don't hear much. I go about my day and then receive an email from my apartment complex saying that they have a community-wide meeting scheduled to discuss the incident and go over resident safety concerns. At this point, I'm wondering what the hell happened. So, of course, I go to the meeting and 
guess what it was? A young single girl living in an apartment by herself showed up mid-afternoon to find Nick inside her apartment. She came in and her drawers were in just complete disarray. He was hiding in a closet and came up with some excuse. The security guards don't actually have keys to any apartments and aren't supposed to be in the residence halls. Later we found out that he had been stalking this girl and stole the keys from maintenance and made copies. This had also been going on for at least a month, if not longer. They also found several of her belongings in his vehicle and he was obviously fired and charged. I didn't follow exactly what happened to him, but we assumed that he did some time. It was obviously a very scary situation and of course our apartment complex got the pants sued out of them. I was glad that his attention shifted, but wonder what could have happened to this girl. But unfortunately, this wasn't the last time that I saw or heard of him. A few weeks ago, over a year since I last saw him, I went into this big fancy mall in my city and guess who was working security? Nick. My first thought was, you've got to be kidding me. My second thought though was, how on earth does this guy keep getting security jobs? Who the hell is dropping the ball here? I saw him and I just turned around and I walked straight out of that door. Thankfully, I'm actually moving out of state next month, but man, do I hope that I never see Nick again. So, uh, I'll get straight to the point here. Every so often, I see this shadow girl. I feel connected to her, but... She also just really terrifies me. She fills me with dread and horror and it's not the kind of fear that makes your heart race and sweat form. It's the kind that makes you cry and feel cold inside. She most often appears when I'm feeling very sad or angry or afraid and only when I'm alone as well. She's hazy and difficult to make out but her presence is definitely palpable. She's rather dark, but not like dark skinned, more like um, a living charcoal drawing or something like that. Sometimes the fear is worse than other times, sometimes I can hardly move and other times I even try to speak to her and if she speaks back, I hear it as a, a voice inside my head. It's definitely feminine, but it's low and almost like a, a smooth growl or something. The first time that I saw her was in a dream when I was very young. I was running from a large monster, a sort of heavy brute animal. I was about to be caught when she appeared. In the dream, she had a colourful wreath around her head and she was floating. Immediately, I felt vastly more afraid than I had been of the beast as well. And the beast seemed to be afraid too, and cowered. I kind of knelt before her and then I woke up and I was crying. Ever since then, she occasionally appears when I'm awake. Although she terrifies me, sometimes I think that she seems to favor me. For example, when I was in middle school, I got along poorly with this one particular girl. One day after I had an argument with her, I saw the shady girl in the bathroom. And the next day, the girl that I argued with came to school with a broken arm. In my freshman year of high school, there was this guy in my speech class who was a low-key bully. He did this thing where he acted like I was cool and he was my friend. Believe me, it was subtle. He was actually mocking me and it was super uncomfortable. He also did this thing where he would pound on my desk and make my face jiggle. I know it sounds stupid, but it made me really embarrassed. But anyway, one day after class, I was in the hallway alone and she appeared. She said something like she would take care of it. And the next day, the guy who mocked me was caught with weed. A few days ago, I was feeling really depressed when she appeared and said that she would try to make it better. A few minutes later, my mum came in and told me that she just decided that we should go out to eat at my favourite restaurant. I know that all of these things have a rational explanation, but it's always right after she appears. And sometimes, too, things just happen more directly. For example, I was in a mental hospital for a few weeks several months ago. One night, I was very angry and I was taking a shower. She appeared and I was afraid, but not embarrassed for some reason. 
She spoke to me, and for once, I actually started to feel calm in her presence. When I got out of the shower, I walked over to the cabinet in the room, and somehow I effortlessly just tore it off the wall, even though it was bolted down. Believe me, I'm super weak, I can't even really do a push-up, so there's no way that I could normally do that. The staff who were also there were really shocked that I was physically able to do that. Another time, after a fight with my dad, I saw her in a dark room, when suddenly I felt that same calm and I walked into the kitchen and I grabbed a large knife, and it didn't really feel like me doing it. It felt like I was just kind of drifting along and watching. I used the knife to threaten my dad, and when he started to plead with me, I felt like I had to break through something, and I dropped the knife, and it felt like something had been holding me up and just left me, and I almost fell. Anyway, you guys might think I'm mental, but the point is is that whenever I see her, whatever she is, whether she's just in my head or something physical and real or spiritual, something always happens. And she really scares me. But I also feel tied to her, and I have no idea what she is, and I would really, really love some advice right now. I was around 12 years old when this all happened. At the time, I lived in the house that I was at for three years and nothing unusual had ever happened. But one summer at 9.30pm, every night on the dot too, I heard knocking on my bedroom window. And when it first happened, I just assumed perhaps an animal had hit my window or something. There were no trees anywhere close to my window, so there was no possibility of a tree branch hitting my window or something like that. It soon became hard to keep ignoring it though and brushing it off as just an animal. I mean, why would an animal hit my window every night at 9.30 on the dot? Also, it was just too distinctly a knocking sound to brush it off as anything but something human. I decided to tell my parents about it whenever it happened, but I suffered from childhood anxiety, so my parents were used to me making a big deal out of sounds and my dad never found anything outside when he would check. He told me that our backyard, where my window looked out to, was fenced in and no one would be able to climb over the fence, knock and then leave without anyone noticing. It also didn't help that we lived in a rather large, lit up neighbourhood so someone would have to see a man coming at every night 9.30, climbing over a fence and then leaving. So I listened to my dad's reasoning and I tried to ignore it again. But it never stopped. At one stage, I honestly began to wonder if I was going crazy. No one else but me had ever heard the knocking, and there was just no logical explanation other than an animal of some sort. I began to think that maybe the knocking was just all in my head. Well, one night, I had a friend over. 9.30 hit, and sure enough, there was a knocking at my window. And my friend froze and asked me if I heard that. I told her yes and that it's been happening every night at the same time for weeks now. I said my dad said that it was an animal. My friend told me that it sounded too much like a knocking to be an animal though. I agreed and we told my dad. He checked for us and sure enough, like every other night, nothing was in our backyard. But the knocking continued after my friend had heard it. And one night, I had gone to bed at 9, but the knocking was so loud at 9.30 that it actually woke me up. I was freaked out and I ran to my dad in the living room. In order to get to the living room from my bedroom too, you had to pass through the hall, which had a clear window door showing our porch in the backyard. And when I passed this door, I looked outside the backyard. And that was when I saw him. I saw a... A bright man dressed in a white robe with long blonde hair running through my backyard. But when he reached the middle of my backyard, he just disappeared. This scared me even more and I went to my dad sobbing that I saw a man and he was knocking on my window. My dad checked outside again and there was just nothing there. He tried to comfort me and said that it was probably some light reflection that I had seen. He calmed me down and told me that if I saw a man again to go and get him, and then I just went back to bed. The strange thing is though is that after that encounter, the knocking just stopped completely. 
I'm 20 now and I still live in that house and I haven't seen or heard anything since that night when I saw the knocking man. So this story takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Clearmont County. So I'm a female, I'm 31 years young now, and this happened in 2006, so at the time I was 17 going on 18. And my boyfriend, we'll call him M, and my friend we'll call A, and her boyfriend, now husband, we'll call N, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. But for some background first, there's this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods, and you can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are some abandoned cars, and an ambulance, some tractors, and other random vehicles like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there, so we would be walking a mile one way to get there, so we're not sure how they could have even got there or how long they would have been there, but my boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previous to our encounter, and it was creepy, but not compared to what happened when we went with A and N. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends T and J. T and myself went upstairs and had a Ouija board. We just asked some random stupid questions that I can't even remember now, but what I do remember is that it spelled out hooey. We said goodbye on the board and we were just looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kid socks in the wall and it was really random and kind of weird. We got pretty startled too when an alarm clock just started ticking. It wouldn't stop as well, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked back downstairs where the boys were, and we made our way back outside. We also found a creepy well that was covered up, and then all of a sudden we heard that alarm clock just start ticking again, but I knew that I had broken it, so that kind of spooked us, but it was nothing too major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we went into, and there was a girl's child boot with a bone inside the shoe, so... I was like, okay, we're done for today, let's get out of here. And my boyfriend and myself were telling ANN about this cabin and what happened when TNJ came with us that time. And so we decided that we were going to go later that day again. The day the encounter happened, M, N, and A and myself went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and crap and spent probably five hours or so at the lake and ate and just kind of hung out. We left the lake and stopped at A&N's house, dropped the cooler off which was in the trunk of the car. This is important for later as well in the story. And after getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had some flashlights but that was about it. The walk there was pretty uneventful as well. We have to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin as well. But we make it there and it wasn't dark out but it seemed just different this time. I'm not sure how to really explain it but it was just different. But we had come later in the day than previously so I just kind of put it down to that and was like okay whatever. Just like last time when we got inside A and myself were going to go upstairs. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall and I also wanted to check out that clock that I broke last visit that I heard ticking outside previously again. But as we start to go up the stairs, there was a big crash like someone was thrown or knocked over. A gets freaked out and then out of nowhere she just books it outside back down the creek yelling at m and and myself to come on. I go chasing after her and she's in tears having a full blown panic attack saying something. Finally I get what she saw. She said that she saw someone looking at the window at us. We tell the guys and literally nobody is around. Only the four of us. Since she's so distraught though, we decide to just go ahead and we leave. So as we're walking back down the creek beds, heading back the same way that we came, which is the only way there, M and N are kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and we realize that there are huge rocks and, I'd say boulders, standing right up in the line the entire way down the creek bed. And they just couldn't have been there. I mean, they were not there even just 20 minutes prior because we would have noticed them because they were huge. So this definitely started to freak us out a bit. This wasn't normal and this was pretty unnatural, so we picked up the pace and we started to haul ass out of there. 
Well, we make it to the first drainage tunnel and we turn on our flashlights and literally none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there and now none of them will turn on. And it was at this point that I was like, what the hell is happening? But 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where A&N's car is parked. A gets in the car because at this point, she's ready to just get the hell home and forget this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car when A suddenly gets out of the car screaming and jumping up and down and flaying around. We get a closer look at her and she is absolutely covered in air. We're like, what the hell is going on here? So we look and they're coming from the back seat from the trunk. Anne opens the trunk of his car and there, laying in the trunk, is this huge, rusty, extremely old woolly sock just covered in ants. Now, remember what I said earlier in the story? We had been in and out of the trunk all day long and I can affirm that there was nothing in the trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. But now, there's this huge woolly sock just covered in ants in the car. This was obviously just way too much for any of us to even wrap our heads around. So, needless to say, we never went back there and I personally will never be going back there again. But I did find out later that it turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was actually named Hubert, and he was often called Huey. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there too. And the man was an alleged child molester. His journals too went into detail about all of his urges and all that stuff. I'm not going to go into that too much, but it was disturbing to say the least. But again, this is honestly the one and only time that I've ever encountered something like this. I'll never be going back to that cabin, ever. Even to this day, just talking about it, and even right now, I just have goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what I saw that scared her so bad in that window, but I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own like that in a line, and nobody could have done it so fast to scare us like that. And also, nobody could have messed with our four flashlights, and nobody could have put that old dirty ant infested woolen sock in ANN's car trunk. I know that this is a bit of a weird story, but if you're ever wandering around my neck of the woods and come across a random cabin, please, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, and what they did, and who or what may still be there. And unfortunately, I learned that the very hard and unsettling way. Nearly 10 years ago, I dated a girl for several months. There had been a, a few red flags right from the start that I should have listened to, but I was naive and kept telling myself that she was a decent person with a terrible streak of bad luck. Our second date was the first time I went to her apartment. We were having a few drinks and watching movies on a computer, and we ended up having, well, you know, right there on the couch. We started dating officially, and it doesn't take long for her to start exhibiting some of the classic clinging girlfriend traits. I'm a little put off by it, I'll admit, but just tell myself that I'm overreacting and not to break it off just because she's a little clingy and insecure. A few months later, I was hanging out at her apartment and found a shoebox in her pajama drawer full of things from her last relationship, which was with a guy, I should mention here too, that I'm a lesbian. There were letters, nude photos of them together, all kinds of stuff. I thought that it was really strange, beyond the obvious reasons, because everything that she had told me about this relationship sounded really awful. She said that he'd hit her, throw her around, say nasty things to her, that he turned her off from men, and just general really crappy relationship stuff. When I asked her why she had this box though, she shrugged it off and didn't really give me an answer. Now, I'm not a jealous person, so I figured that it was just some sort of healing process stuff. Again though, I was naive, but I pretty much ignored it. But here is where it starts to get real fun. So fast forward a few months, and one night we're talking, and she tells me this story about a man that her mum dated when she was six or seven years old that she didn't like. The man had a son that was about ten years old that lived with him, 
She wanted her mum's boyfriend gone, so she told her mum that he had molested her one night while he was looking after her and his son. He didn't, mind you, and had him arrested. The son told the police that nothing had happened and that he'd been with her the whole night, but the man actually went to prison anyway and was beaten to death by a biker gang. She ended this story with a laugh and said, I wonder where they buried him, then just continued on with her day as if she hadn't just dropped this giant what the F story on me. To be honest with you, to this day, I still don't know if it actually happened or if she just made it up to show me how evil she could be. Either one is insane, but I decided right there, though, that I needed to break it off with her without unleashing the I'll come to your house and kill you in your sleep type of psycho that I knew was in her somewhere. It takes a few weeks, but I managed to break up with her. She still messaged me constantly, but I was getting better at not being sucked into her guilt trips. Then she started sending me webcam photos of us that I'd never seen before. I didn't connect what they were until she started sending me videos. Remember that second date at her apartment? Well, she started recording the whole thing on her webcam and I had no idea. My stomach still knots and my blood boils when I think about this. About two weeks after the breakup, I got an ominous goodbye type message from her, also saying that she wanted to see me one last time. I lived on the opposite side of the city and really didn't feel like taking a two-hour bus commute to go deal with more of her melodramatic bullshit, so I contacted two of her friends that live close by, one of which was actually six months pregnant, and asked if they could go and check on her. And my day goes on until I got a phone call from the police. They filled me in on what happened. But when the friends went to her apartment, she answered the door wielding a large knife and went ballistic when she realized that I wasn't there. The friends ran and called the police and when the officers arrived they put her in handcuffs and brought her to a psych ward. And after looking through the apartment, the cops found her bedroom covered with lit candles and photos of me, or us, spread out just all over the bed. And in the living room, they found a suicide note that was several pages long. In it, she had talked about my death and how it couldn't be helped. I was in shock, so the cop had to spell it out for me, but she had every intention of killing me and then killing herself. He said that you did the right thing by not coming over here. She continued stalking me online after this, and when I blocked her on all social media platforms, she started sending me threatening texts. I answered long enough to tell her that if she didn't leave me alone, that I'd be filing a restraining order. This kept her away for a few days, until she showed up at the venue that I was working at and tried to attack me. Big thanks to the quick reflexes of the security guard on site for keeping me safe that night too. The next day, she acts like nothing happened. I eventually filed for a restraining order and wasted six months of my time dealing with courts only to have the judge dismiss the case as lady spat. The stalking eventually stopped but I was always on high alert. Even today, the sight of magenta fire hydrant red hair dye just makes my skin crawl. I work at the Winchester Mystery House, which means that I hear a lot of stories. I'm really not the type of person to delve much into the paranormal, but I've definitely seen a few things myself that aren't easy to explain. I'd like to hear what things other people have seen too, but then maybe I can check it out myself. I've been at the house past midnight more than a few times as well. I'll start sharing though. Hopefully guests and other workers will share and I'll keep updating as I see or hear more things. Also, I'm really not one to dramatize things, so I apologize if this doesn't have added excitement or anything. I just want to report what I've experienced and see what other people have seen or even heard. So, somewhere in the house during the current Halloween themed Unhinged, I won't say where right now since I don't have to give away the scene, but there's a motion sensor. When the people pass it, I was coming back from break, 10pm or so, and was alone in this section of the house. I was stationed near where the actor would hide and jump out when the queue went off. I thought that it'd be fun to scare whoever set it off. I assumed a co-worker or the actor returning. 
so I made it behind the corner. But nobody ever came. Maybe someone came in but turned back. It's possible, I suppose. Around ten minutes later, my other co-worker came up, also finishing his break. Our section all takes breaks at around the same time. And we were just talking. And the queue went off again, but nobody was there. Now, it's not a sensitive queue or anything, because whenever I work, it only goes off if someone goes through. My third co-worker thought that we were just trying to spook her when we told her what happened, but then she gasped. She didn't want to tell us at first, not wanting to seem like our story scared her, I guess, but later she said that she felt a tug going up the stairs when we were walking. That's not unheard of here, and there are many people who get that tug. Another thing that happened was I saw laundry mangled in the laundry room spin on its own, and another time I was going up to the switchback stairs, below ceiling and narrow and turns about seven times. And I swear to you that something shushed me right next to my ear. When I was a student teacher, I was 21 and working with mostly seniors in high school many of which were 17 or 18 years old. Now one day, the mentor teacher that I was working with pulled me aside from teaching my class to inform me that other teachers had overheard some students telling each other that they wanted to do something with me. While disturbing, many of my friends and colleagues insisted that that's a fact of being a young teacher working with high schoolers. The next day, I had a few girls in my class though approach me and inform me that Three specific boys were no longer just talking about what they wanted to do, but were graphically describing what they were now planning on doing to me in the coming weeks after school in the parking lot. Far more details too than I'd like to share here. I went to the administration immediately and they handled it very quickly and professionally. I was very grateful for their support. I was never touched nor harmed by any of these students, thankfully. But what did scare the absolute crap out of me, however, is that not even a week later, one of those boys was actually arrested and pulled out of school. I didn't find out immediately, but I eventually learned that he was being held for the alleged sexual assault of his younger sister. It makes me sick just thinking about it still, but I honestly think that I just dodged a bullet. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.